Okay, so back to SMB POSIX extensions. Here we get a chance to have Jeremy talking about all the things that you lose sleep over, Simlink, leaking Etsy password files. I get to talk about things like I'm sitting watching Metz's talk and I'm wondering why I'm getting mode bits that say question mark, question mark, question mark. You know, we all have our perspectives of the bugs that bother us every day. And as a client developer, Linux kernel and server developer, they're slightly different, but they have an influence on our POSIX extensions. POSIX is not Linux. Linux is not POSIX. So, Jeremy, you worked with guys on the POSIX committees, right? Some of them. And I think at this conference, there are people who worked on that. The Linux API is bigger. We talk about POSIX, but what matters more is that apps work. When we look at the syscalls, you know, I think it was interesting in the last talk, right? How many syscalls did, did he end up finding in his perf tool? He was missing some, actually. That syscall interface is what actually matters because the apps actually depend on that, not strictly POSIX. POSIX what matters is that apps work. And obviously there are other POSIX-like operating systems. You know, we've heard of Macs. I won't admit that the last two talks were given on Macs. But besides that, BSD operating systems and others. And now we have a Windows personality that is Linux-like as well. These apps have to work. We need, but we have to improve the common situations where you know, we're accessing the same data. And we also have to deal with the deprecation of SIFs. Last two weeks, a lot of mail on the list. Back and forth to Linus and others and us in the Samba team about the SMB client in the kernel going to SMB3. 4.7 is coming out soon. 4.7 is going to see people breaking, as we saw downstairs in the test lab, as we go to 3.1.1 from a lot of client tools that defaulted to SIFs. This deprecation of SIFs has implications because SIFs supported POSIX extensions. Now, what works today? If you, like we were doing during the talks earlier, if you mounted with the Minshul French Simlinks and Sipsackle, thank you, Sharish, and IDs from SID, so here's what it would look like with 3.0 with the emulation of Unix stuff without the extensions, the best emulation we can do, and here's what it would look like just mounting to Samba normally with the Unix extensions. If you look at these, what works? Well, emulated Simlinks work. Hard links work. POSIX characters can be remapped. They don't look normal on the local system, and local files with asterisks don't look normal over this, but you can map them over the network and they read back over the network. The mode bits look right. And in some cases, when Samba is returning the well known SID for um, the UID and GID, things look good. So here's an example what works. Now, up here is a local directory. Notice I created a bunch of local files with things you don't want to do in Windows. Asterisks, colons, trailing spaces, trailing periods, that sort of thing, right? Look at those files, and then look how they appear here. You know, f 3 uri is not very intuitive, right? So those local files we can't do. With the Unix extensions we're talking about, those will look normal, rather than being remapped strangely. Now, Notice the mode bits, file created is 444, 444, owner is root, looks good, 774, looks 774, 777, all this stuff, the mode bits, all that stuff works. Simlinks, I create a simlink over the network, it works. I create a file with an asterisk over the network, it works. So, no real problem with things we create over the network, but reading some of the local files is a problem. Simlinks are emulated. And there are some features, POSIX, rename, and delete, that I'm not showing you here. But there are some corner cases where POSIX, rename, and delete fail. We have other alternatives. You know, Apple, right? We can use Apple if we wanted. Now, if we want to look at a trace that, you know, Ralph provided here. Thank you, Ralph. Here is an example of their create context. Right? So here is what you see in Apple. But it doesn't give us very much. You know, case sensitivity, a couple other minor things. but. You know, this response doesn't really help us as much in solving the Unix extension problem. So we're stuck with Unix extensions. Well, what was wrong with what we had before? Well, remember, SIFs got deprecated. And WannaCry, 
you want to talk about WannaCry or anything interesting? No? Anybody want to run, run for cover? We got a lot of uh, negative publicity about SMB generally because of something that really might not be much of an issue for us, but SIFS is insecure compared with SMB3. We talked about that in your talk, for example, right? NTLM deprecation, for example. SMB3 is really good in a lot of ways, not just performance, not just security. So moving there, we end up losing our SIFS Unix extensions. Now there's some really cool history here. Were you ever at SCO? No. So remember, they, they're, they're the ones who came up with this, right, around 1997. SCO and HP. SCO and HP, and, and you were at HP at one point. Yes. So in 97, I think it was 97, these extensions came up. They got published in our SNEA document, you know, when I was chair back kind of 15 years ago. They got published in the SNEA document. We revised them, Jeremy and I revised them at least once or twice. And these extensions had been, you know, almost 20 years now. But we've got to deprecate SIFs. And we also have to make it smaller. We've got to be able to deal with the challenges of create, rename, and delete, right? Where you're renaming on top of a file, access denied, silly rename. We want to avoid all the NFS silly rename kind of issues. We can emulate some of this, but we don't want to have to break POSIX semantics. What about the inode metadata? Well, there are things like the link count that don't really come back quite right. Also, the file type if it's a FIFO, for example. Certain inode information that doesn't come back uh, in, the, in the info levels we have available to us. What about locking? Advisory locks are different than normal Windows locks for good and bad. Uh, Jeremy spent half his life, I think, dealing with locking. I don't know if you want to talk about it or if it's a nightmare. Not yeah. In any case, yeah. So POSIX locking is very different than um, you know merging, merging locks when you uh, overlap, for example. They're advisory. Now, how do we indicate that it's a POSIX lock? Similarly, how do we get FS info? This is less important than some, but there's things like uh, I don't know the inode count, a couple of things that come back from when you do a stat FS that is different than what Windows can return. There's two fields, I think, in the structure. All of these were dealt with in the past with relatively modest extensions to the um, info levels. But we're trying to keep it small. OK, so we have a server perspective. And so let's, um, let's talk about the server perspective. And I'll switch gears to Jeremy now. Out of the way as possible, so I don't uh, get feedback. Okay. Um, so the server perspective on the uh, SMB2 Unix extensions. Well, they're horribly late. Uh, they should have been done years ago. Um, this is partly his fault, partly my fault. Um, and one of the reasons for that, really, is that the SMB1 Unix extensions worked too well. Um, so while SMB1 was still there and lying around um, and was available, there was really no pressure to get the SMB2 extensions done. So um, in typical open source fashion, if nobody's screaming at you, you go and work on the things that they are screaming at, at you about, which are different. Um, so essentially the SMB uh, the, the Unix SMB2 extensions were kind of an interesting possibility, knocked around, but mostly ignored and, and not pursued. Then came WannaCry, uh, and everything changed after that. Uh, SMB1 is dead, 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 dead. And there are security issues that, are, that have come up with it, that are going to continue to come up with implementations with SMB1. Um, that means that the sooner we can nail this thing in its coffin, the better. Um, it is, um, it's too complicated to implement safely. Um, anyone who's chatted to me now, I have to get on my hobby horse about not writing network code in C, which is ironic being as that's what I do for most of my life. Um, but that's, uh, that's basically because we have this massive, massive legacy code base that we need to keep running. If I was doing new networking code, I wouldn't be doing it in C. And SMB1 has too many moving parts, too many verbs that make it 
possible to have errors in the implementation of them that allow exploits. And in many ways, the Unix extensions make that worse. Um, and what I'm talking about specifically is symlinks. Um, so how did symlinks end up in the SMB1 Unix extensions um, in such a terrible way? Uh, and I'm talking about Samba here because Samba was the, really the, the only server that ever implemented the Unix extensions. So um, the, the, well, I, I guess Max did. I don't know whether they implemented uh, in, in their uh, replacement server. Um, so the security issues getting this right are paramount. Um, and the goal was not to screw up the SMB2 protocol the way SMB1 was, was screwed up. It, in many ways, it was very easy to do things in SMB1 because there were so many verbs, there were so many things that it can do that adding a few more extra info levels and calls, they couldn't really make it any worse. Um, it was like, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... <laughs> It's just a few more opcodes. Who's going to notice? You have to implement them all anyway. Um, but the goal, really, and, and one of the reasons I've been dragging my feet on this, is I, I wanted to do. Has anyone read Isaac Asimov's wonderful book, The End of Eternity? Or is it only me? Okay. Well, go out and buy a copy. It's it's a wonderful book uh, about a time traveling organization who who safeguards the human race by making very small changes in the past. Uh, and their goal is always to make the minimum necessary change, which is to go back and sort of, you know, move a soda can from one shelf to another so that somebody misses it and causes a chain of events that, you know, brings a civilization down or something. Uh, and that's what I really want to do with SMB2 to make it work very uh, accurately uh, between Linux and Linux or POSIX to POSIX, is to make as few changes to the protocol we can get away with and learn from the horrible things that happened with SMB1 to try and avoid them. Uh, the good news is, um, while we've been waiting, Microsoft's been extending the protocol and making these things easier. And the other side of the server perspective, the other things that, that has been uh, extremely amusing to watch was the fact that running Linux in the Azure uh, cloud has become very important, and so the Linux subsystem that's been added to Windows, the Linux kernel emulation, emulation, means that allowing Windows to implement many of these POSIX features has become more important to Microsoft, and therefore some of the teams up there have been thinking about the right way to do these things and how you would remote them in a protocol. So. Um, server followed symlinks, an absolute disaster. Why are they an absolute disaster and why did they happen? Um, so back when Samba was first created, um, Tridge and I and Volker were doing this um, in the early 90s. Uh, essentially, it's a way of exporting a Unix file system to Windows clients. And a lot of our users back in Sonos basically said, well, it's great, I have this wonderful Samba setup, I've added a new disk, I've moved all the data over, I don't want to change my share definitions, I just want to add a symlink and have the server follow it. And we were kind of like, oh, no problem. <laughs> That's easy, just put a new path in, the server will follow the symlinks. In fact, looking back and thinking about it, at that time there was no way to prevent the server following the symlinks. If you remember back when symlinks were first added, they're completely transparent to user space applications. There's no way to actually say, you know, I really don't want to follow this specific symlink. Um, so that's fine. And so long as all you're doing is exporting server-side symlinks via Samba, so that the only way you can get at your remote file server is via SMB coming into this, this one server, everything works until the Unix extensions turn up and allow clients to create symlinks. And then the worst design decision I think we've ever made, I think, I think it was, was it me who made it? Probably me, um, was to store the client created symlinks as real symlinks on the server file system. This is probably the, you know, the single worst thing anyone could have done. It was probably me. At that point, 
you have created race conditions from which there is no escaping. Um, we've put band-aids around this reasonably well, actually, but it's, it's become an utter disaster because clients can race you in the middle of doing things. You can check a path that's safe. They can stick a sim link in after the check has gone in um, and your host at that point. So, you know, there are, I, I did a talk at Samber XP this year about how you actually fix this. And it's, it's fixable, it's just incredibly painful to fix correctly. So, for the SMB2 Unix extensions, I absolutely will not allow client-side sim links to be stored as real sim links on the server file system um, that, uh, that servers might even accidentally follow. Now, this is gonna break dual export for NFS clients um, and, um, uh, and SMB2. And I don't care. The security downside of it is so great that um, it would be easier to ask the NFS servers to export these things as, as client scene sim links than right, right now, if the NFS servers are in kernel, they can do things safely and they just respond to these uh, server side sim links. We send them back as client side sim links. But we're just not doing this uh, in SMB2. Yes, thank you. Tom. NFS servers create such sim links. The clients will create a sim link, the NFS server will create it. The NFS protocol or the NFS kernel implementation has you know, counter countermeasures to prevent that from opening security holes. Are we at risk of making a protocol requirement to satisfy the Samba architecture? Um, are we at risk of doing a protocol requirement? I so don't client, think so. So as a client perspective here, my reaction was, I think I asked first, Colin was right, because on the clients, the server siblings, as we were trying to do emulation within Windows, both in parse points, so many times what we found is that the paths within siblings have no meaning to the client. Right. So the concept that client systems coming in remotely prefer the siblings aren't really relative to, you know, we don't want to go to NC password. We want to go to paths that we understand as clients, which may not be the same main space as the server. Right. It might not be a path at all. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. as a client, I prefer this. And this is yeah. one of the lessons from the client perspective that I saw trying to look at reparse points as ways yeah. of doing this. That if it's a server path, I really don't want to follow it. I want to I agree with so, not allowing the server so, to follow it. So I'm constraining it in some Well, so yeah, I, I disagree with the fact that so the comment is are you breaking the protocol spec in order to um, satisfy the Samba architecture. I, I, I would have said you had a point, but for the fact that the s protocol specs on repass points in SMB2 explicitly say these must never be server followed, right? So I, I think we have precedence here and what I'm doing in doing this, yeah, I, I'm ignoring NFS, that's true. Um, so, you know, am I making things harder for NFS? Yes. Do I care? No. Um, not at the moment, because right now I'm, I'm more concerned about security issues. What, so long as a client gets back what it stores as a sim link, it's a server, it's a server um, decision, design decision on how it stores them. And so the goal will be is clients will always get back what they send back. Will what we store be Why convenient? They use the Unix extensions. The Unix, the Unix extensions to do so. Yes. It's a protocol specific. Yes. Uh, yes. Now you know we can strongly recommend that these not be stored as server followable sim links. But somebody could do an implementation that did do so if they had a server that provided, provided they. they, they the yes, that's to right. Yes. So, you know, I, that would be a better way to state. Yeah, okay. I, I, <laughs> that's that's essentially uh, I, here here go I with, you know, many arrows in my back and, yeah. and what I'm trying to do at this point is say 
please I'm just don't. Correct. I'm not trying to disagree with you. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. I understand. I think it's an important question. Yes, it's that. not a samba. The line is a samba statement, not a protocol statement. Yes, yes, that is, that is correct. That is a, but I mean, this is the server perspective, and I'm a samba server that's creator, fine. so. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good clarification to make. Um, samba will not be storing those as server followable symlinks. Okay. Um, yeah. See, unless I misunderstood you, it sounds like you thought that this was going to break how uh, NFS or would break dual protocol support. Uh, does well, NFS present symlinks as a symlink object over the NFS protocol and follow it on the client? Uh, so the comment is, isn't how is this going to break NFS? Well, because if we don't store right right now, most NFS server implementations will read uh, symlinks on the file system and present them back to the client as symlinks. So if we store the server, so if we store the client symlinks in some place other than in the file system as standard server followable symlinks, then current NFS servers won't see those as client followable symlinks and therefore won't report them back to the client. Um, and so that's what I mean. So and, the, and the, that's, the same operation from the corresponding operation from the NFS client, then we then following the going into the student wouldn't have the same effect. Um, the NFS server would not see yes, those symlinks stored by the Samba specific implementation as uh, it would something other than yes. a symlink, which yes. the yes. NFS client would not follow them. It yes, exactly, right. exactly. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's a design decision that I think we have to make simply because of the issues that have come up with allow originally allowing server full of symlinks. And to be fair, there. you could teach the NFS server in such a system how to return this. Exactly, and, and the whole point, at least for Samba, is what I'm expecting we will do is we will use the repass point uh, uh, protocol spec and store them in exactly the same way that the Windows server stores them, which is essentially in a repass point EA. So the Linux or other NFS servers could be taught to, to if they see an EA with this specific name and the specific repass tag type, to return those as a client symbol. The current Linux kernel client does understand the NFS repass point that we're talking about in Windows. And you know, waiting on Samba to have a uh, reparse point implementation yep. so they can store it's fine because from a client perspective, fallbacks are, are fine. There's no hard, there's no bad thing about fallbacks. So, so the reason I put this is is basically because I'm trying to, to beseech server manufacturers, you know, don't don't do what seems easy because we did what seemed easy and it's a nightmare. Um, yes. One more question or, or comment. I mean, it was earlier made uh, uh, there was the, the comment that for the NFS server in the, in the Linux kernel, there's not the same problem with race conditions because there are protection mechanisms for mm -hmm. these things. But I mean, there are others. They use base servers around. This, this, popular, so it may call out for broader yeah. discussions between the two protocols. This is, this is true. There is also, at least on Linux, there is the Ganesha server. The Ganesha server actually gets around this, I believe, by doing the same trick that Samba does, which is to CD into the directory and, and to open the uh, path name with an oh no follow. Um, but they're doing it all of root, which scares the hell out of me. But <laughs> yeah, um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's an important clarification. And, and so, yeah. Finish that up, I guess. Sorry, uh, yep. Do you see any problem with representing uh, symlinks in the file system as symlinks so long as they're presented to SMB as reparse points and presented to NFS as symlinks so that they'll be followed on the client side? You know, in other words, so, to, to arrange to always follow them on the client side? Um, the issue is if you do store uh, client created symlinks in the file system as symlinks, you are making the life of a user space server creator much, much harder. Now, they're going to have to do that work anyway, because you can have local, um, you can have locally created symlinks, NFS certainly, plonk symlinks in, etc. So, you know, the server is going to, the, the user space um, 
SMB3 server is going to have to protect itself against following sim links that go outside of a share anyway. But it, it, removing the capability, at least over SMB3 only, for a client to create real sim links on the server file system eliminates a whole class of problems. So what I'm thinking about is a future CVE when someone finds another race condition, and I can basically say, turn off NFS. <laughs> And the, and the problem goes away. <laughs> yeah, but I guess, I guess my problem, you, know, you do that, but you're gonna, the cost you're going to pay is a certain amount of interoperability between. We, we, we have a lot of customers that really like the fact that they can use data simultaneously between NFS and SMB. And sure, and, and, and the, the whole point about that is they will be able to use data simultaneously between SMB and NFS, just not the sim links. Well, and even siblings, if their server chooses to implement the NFS free parse point, as Windows does, right? Windows has an NFS free parse point. Local apps don't follow it. Right, exactly. Yeah. As long as local apps don't follow it, the, if you have a free parse point mechanism in your server and you don't worry about local apps following it, your NFS server is free, as Windows does, to return these as siblings to NFS. Yeah. But it, it essentially means that the NFS server has to change. Uh, if, if you want to have complete transparency of a client creating a sim link on SMB3 and an NFS. Well, that was my earlier question that I'm now confused about. I'm not aware of any, uh, none of the protocol versions that we support in NFS follow sim links on the server side ever, as far as I know. No, but if. Uh, did you get, did you, I can't remember if we were in last fall, did you get the NFS files change? Yeah, we have referral stuff. In NFS? So you already have three uh, parts points for NFS and NFS understands. Right, right, right. That's, I don't think, anyway, yeah. maybe this is getting too deep for anything. So, so the, 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 the actual issue essentially is not that. So when you, it isn't on your system where you have an internal SMB3 server and an internal NFS server that can share a view of what the uh, sim links looks like. It's uh, on systems where they're running a user space SMB server, specifically Samba, and they have an internal NFS server currently, with no change to the code, if we implement sim links in Samba that way, then client-created sim links on SMB will not be seen as sim links by NFS clients and vice versa. Sim links created on the file system by NFS clients will not be reported back as sim links to SMB3 clients. So you will still have interoperability so long as, with the current code with no changes, so long as you don't expect symlink interoperability. Uh, and I, I, that's at least, for security in terms of Samba, that's the price I'm willing to pay. Um, so, um, the key to doing this right, I think, um, is Essentially, now that we've moved to SMB3, everything is handle, not path name based. There's only a few path name operations that always turn into handles. The key to it is essentially to make specific handles POSIX style handles, as Steve talked about. So you will open a file with a create context. You will only expect this to succeed if the server has already told you in its negotiate context, hey, I'm willing to do POSIX handles, uh, I'm, I'm a server that understands POSIX handles, the um, TCon extension, the, the TreeConnect uh, extension is an optimization that we might then use to say, on this share, never ask for POSIX handles, or on this share, you may ask for POSIX handles. But even so, a server that reports on the NEGPROT that it can do POSIX handles must always be willing to receive a create request containing a POSIX handle request, and it will just reject it if it can't create POSIX handles on that particular path. Name. Yes, Michael. Using the, uh, are you saying using the negotiates uh, extensions of, uh, of the CHP1 one, one was it, right? So that's the first version. That will be the first, there will be, that's correct. So all, all the versions will be kind of. Yes, all, all the versions will not do, but because that's, that's also the first secure version that allows the negotiate um, validation after. I, I don't think there's any point in trying to retrofit this right. into earlier versions of SMB. This will make it be officially negotiable instead of yes. in contrast to the other Yes, okay. that's, that's correct. Thanks. So um, the client determines if the server can support POSIX extensions and um, 
will make a decision, you can always reject it. You can always say, no, I'm not giving you a POSIX 100 on that. And the client has to fall back. And that's basically because you may have a share that consists of mounted file systems that are knitted together, some of which are POSIX capable and some of which are not. So it is possible that as you traverse the path names within a share, you may hit an area that won't do POSIX support. And that would, the case for that would be, imagine that you had mounted a fat USB drive or something into a POSIX file system and you were exporting the whole thing. And you may say, who would ever do that? That's crazy. <laughs> you haven't been reading Samba Technical. <laughs> there, are, there are people who do that and say, why doesn't this work? So, you know, you have to be able to cope with people doing stupid, what you think are stupid and crazy things. Um, so it would be nice if the protocol can cope with that and at least the client, uh, uh, the server at that point can say, no, I'm sorry, I really can't give you a, a, a POSIX handle on slash MNT slash DOS fat or something. Um, so that's the um, crossing uh, mount points. I, I don't really want to do it the Apple way if we can avoid it, which is sort of a, a probe on the root of a share. Um, it would be much nicer to be able to do this on a per handle basis. And so the key is we already have a lot of experience because internally we mark handles. We've already marked handles as being POSIX capable and Windows capable. So we already have the experience and um, the, the knowledge of many, many years of, of working code to cope with things like how do the byte range locking semantics interoperate? How do the share modes interoperate when you've got a POSIX handle and non-POSIX handle? How does the delete on close operate when you have some clients who are asking for normal Windows SMB3 handles and some clients asking for POSIX extension SMB3 handles? How would they interoperate when one of them wants to delete it, etc.? We So we already have a lot of experience in actually making that work. And I'm not going, going to go into the specific details on that, um, but that what, that's what will come out of, of basically um, prototype implementations followed by specifications that other people can comment on. Uh, let's see, so yeah. Um, the biggest change, that, that so like I say, the nice thing about being lazy and prevaricating is that the changes we now end up with are really, really small. Um, we not gonna return POSIX ACLs. We will return everything as SIDS and Windows ACLs. Uh, I know this is something that at least Gordon has been concerned about in the past. But what I realized is there's no reason that you can't present a Unix user group world mode bit as a, a subset of a Windows ACL. So if you have a file system that doesn't do extended ACLs at all and only does um, standard POSIX mode bits, you can still represent those as a Windows ACL um, and, and return it. Uh, and, and then doing a, a, a Chimod operation from the client essentially just means writing a three element Windows ACL. Um, and so clients have got to cope with mapping SID, so we don't do POSIX ACLs because they were draft never completed in any way. We don't do UIDs and GIDs, everything comes across as SIDs. And the final, um, the final difficulty um, it is basically uh, the, the path name handling because uh, Windows has many reserved characters, colons, um, slashes, etc., all sort of the weird control characters. Whereas in POSIX, you only have null and slash. Everything else is allowed. So um, rather than changing the encoding, UCS2 is fine. We don't want to have two sets of path name parsing functions because that way lies another set of horrible security bugs that we can avoid. So essentially, you, you just send a POSIX path name where there would be a Windows path name uh, encoded in UCS2, and the presence of the POSIX create context means you interpret this path name differently, and it will be case sensitive, it will be, um, you know, it, uh, and it will be, be unmapped, it will be case sensitive, and if you get a reply back with the POSIX create context associated with it, at that point, you've got a POSIX handle. You'll get POSIX locks, you'll get POSIX delete and close semantics, you'll get POSIX rename semantics. Um, Question for you about your, uh, uh, the app and the modes and so forth. 
So, do you consider that out of scope with regard to trying to specify using expansions and just leave that entirely up to the client? Sorry, the, using the, the expansions uh, of. Who, whose problem is it to worry about what mode to present on Linux but, you know, on, the, on the client? That is, that oh, uh, so, so, yeah. Are we going to specify? There's some schemes for encoding the mode bits in the yes. UID and GID and the actuals. Is that standardized anywhere? Yes. Is that part of what you're. Uh, I, so, so, the comment is. How, are you going to just dump it on the clients and let them cope with it? I, I think what I think the best way to do that is Windows already has the Windows NFS server already has a method of encoding that. The easiest thing to do might be to just take that specification and say, okay, this is the. I, I mean, there's no you can't you can't force servers to do that, but to say this is a recommended way. Um, when you get back an ACL for the mode, this is the recommended way of encoding the ACL. This is what the client should expect. It might be nice to get a spec for that someday, because I've seen at least two or maybe three methods of doing that now. Yeah, there's, the, uh, Samba also has a different way. I, yeah. I don't think we should drop the Samba one. I think we should stick as closely as possible to the Windows NFS one, um, and then just, yeah, just pick that. And as you say, there's the Mac you can look at there now thing as well. But, yeah. But I think that, that this, in some sense, is invisible to the protocol. Right. This is a good document to have, and it's important. But the mode bits as they're presented, they do affect interoperability if you're setting SMB3 actuals. But All right. So we're actually running close to the end, because I think we have to finish at 3.50. We've got five minutes, so I'm going to hand over to you, Steve. And okay. yeah. So the boring details are so much smaller. So this is nice. So if you want to yeah, you might turn that inward, too. Okay, so what are the what are the extensions we're talking about? First things, these are the, the actual details. So the we need a context number reserved, right? So no big deal. We have one and two reserved right now. We're gonna have a three or four, whatever it is Microsoft gives us. And the same thing for the tree connect context. So as we talked about, if POSIX open context are not supported, don't return the negotiate context as a server. Now, if you support for some servers, for some shares, some files within a share, no problem. We talked about how to deal with that. You reject the open, but you don't ignore the context. So, when we come in with a POSIX context, we want a POSIX handle. So if you can't support POSIX, and you've told me you can support POSIX, reject the open. And with, with the tree connect negotiate, we'll be able to, to be much more optimal about this and have some shares that are supported POSIX and some not. Okay, so what does it actually look like? It's a huge structure. No, it's not, it's trivial. Data length zero and a number. Pretty easy, right? So, we talked about the requirements. If your server says it supports this, well, we're expecting you to support the POSIX unlinked renamed semantics because you can actually do damage if you say you support and don't. Same with case sensitivity, right? If we don't support case sensitivity and we think you do, you better reject that open because we can end up with some damage if you, you know, the case sensitive uh, problem. The kernel make has uh, two files with the same name differing in the case. Advisory locking, as Jeremy said, it's really on the wire OFD locking. And there's a link there if you want to look up OFD, but it's very close to POSIX locking in. But sane. But sane, yes. There are some very strange things that happen when you close a handle. Other process, you know, it's anyway, never mind. POSIX locking we know is very strange. OFD is documented and it's implemented internally, and there's an API in Linux for this. You can go look at the blog if you care. And the paths are not remapped. You don't need to do this remapping that I showed you earlier because, you know, asterisk and colon, we're sending UCS2, take the asterisk, you're converting it to UTF 8, no problem, no mapping. Uh, just a simple norm. The, the benefit of that is it can Yep. Which I consider a massive plus. Yep. Okay. Hard links? Well, hard links you set info already. No big deal. Sim links are client only. We have two ways of doing this, right? We have the NFS reparse point and MF sim links. The Mitchell French Apple style ones that Conrad and I did. So MF sim links are a file, a certain size, type, whatever. Uh, the NFS one is a reparse point. When Samba supports reparse points, it's pretty easy to imagine um, the default being using the NFS reparse point for this. These are client followed. Server can do whatever they want to store these. If the server wants to store them you know, in EAs, great. If the server wants to do something else, great, whatever. But the server can decide how it wants to store these. 
we have recommendations. Obviously, some, he talked about how Samba will do it. F allocate and some Linux specific operations are already mapped to Windows um, Windows operations. And you know, if we find other operations that are, that are not available, we'll need to create new info levels. Now, what about open? It's allowed to have POSIX opens, non-POSIX opens on the same one. All we care about is that POSIX create context and the server returning that POSIX create context on the open reply or rejecting it. It is allowed to have some files that are POSIX and some not POSIX on the same share. So what does it look like? Enormously complicated right now, it's not. Look at this, here is a standard SMB3 create context. This is what it looks like. What are we having to do? We have to come up with a name. A GWID, yeah. I mean, we could say JRA space, no, no. Wait. but you know, we have this, what is it, eight byte? Uh, that's all we care about in this part of it. Now, what does the data blob look like for the create context? Is it huge? No. This is, and by the way, this is the beauty of having 20 years of experience on this because SEO, HP, and then later the, the SNESFs, the extensions, we had this level, what, 109 was it? I forget. All we need are the open flags and basically the POSIX permissions that we're, we're talking about, that, that, that fake mode we're talked about. So as long as we can specify the mode bits and as long as we can specify these open flags, you know, O, direct, and all these kinds of things, right? That's all we need. These are two 32-bit quantities. Not much. Okay, in the response, what do we need? Well. We know it's a file or directory, right? But what if it's a FIFO or block dev? You set it zero, it's a file or directory because we know what it is. We got it from there. If it's not, if it's a block dev or a FIFO or a care dev, set, we already have these flags. Or we already have these flags in our, in our current Unix extensions. So if it's zero, it's a file or directory, go look in the rest of it. Unique ID, well, we might be able to leave this off, but the inode number, you know, if you support inode numbers, Maybe it's good enough just to punt and not return that. Permissions. Once again, you're returning the three aces. How do we get the UID and GID? From the ace. First ace has a SID. It's really easy in a lot of ways because if it's uh, the Unix SID, embedded right in the middle of it is the Unix UID I can st strip out. If not, I can go ask you know, a user space uh, winbind like thing or SSSD to figure this out. But once again, three aces in order, user, group owner, everyone. And that gives you your mode and your owners. And that's it. This is a pretty small thing. What else do you need? Well, you got some info levels for query, dir, and um, set info. These are what they look like in the, you know, not much to return on the, um, on the query, but query, dir, and query set info have these levels. Um, they're very similar to what you saw, here, but a little bit less. And remember, the mode bits and owners come out of this three-ace structure. StatFS, as we saw before, it's a level that returned a couple extra fields, but it was pretty minor and probably even optional. You could probably get by with rejecting that. So where do we go from here? With one minute left, where do we go from here? Actually, we finished the in any case, where do we go from here? These are relatively modest extensions, but we have a trivial define for uh, negotiate context, a trivial define for a create context. We have a little bit of homework to do hammering out the query info, set info, reader level, the same one ideally for this, but you'd be surprised how much all that matters is open in a lot of ways, right? If I can't do a query info, at least I got the stuff on open. So it's actually not as bad as it thinks. You're not going to change from a FIFO to a block dev in the middle of, a, you know, the, middle of the operation. We're going to be in Redmond next week. We can continue on this. We've had some informal discussions with other server vendors and other clients. We don't want to do stupid things. So if that idea of the simple negotiate context and simple create context sounds bad, let's, let's not do that. In any case, the documentation, we're going to have to define, we already have defines for some of it. We have the query info, query FS info, the set info will match the query info, and then we have the, the query dir will match the query info. These are probably uh, required except for the query FS info. You can return error op not supported, but we can debate about that if you want. 
Uh, in any case, none of the fields that come back are any different than what you'd already be returning on the open, so this isn't controversial. And I'm perfectly happy as a kernel client maintainer of checking in a version of this and then changing our mind in a release or two. You know, marking it experimental, it's fine with me. Because it's so important, not just to try it with user space tools, not just to try it with one client, but to try it with as many clients as we can with real apps. Because, as we saw as we're sitting through Metz's presentation, how did the mode turn to question mark, question mark? You know, we want to avoid that kind of thing. Anyway, we definitely want feedback here, and you know, others, a lot of the delays about you know, getting the right web server and all that, you know, we need to, to uh, not worry about that. Okay, closing thoughts from Jeremy. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, Steve and I next week, uh, as long as we don't have any security issues that blow up suddenly and unexpectedly, which can always happen, uh, we should have some prototype code that's, that's looking like posits sometime by the end of next week. Um, and then, of course, once we think we have something that works, the, the goal is to actually write up the document and put it out there for public comment before we do anything like committing anything into, into repositories. Um, so, you know, it, it, in some ways, being lazy and waiting is a win um, because we've got much less to do now. Um, so, uh, but I, I wouldn't really recommend it. Recommend it. We probably should have done this five to ten years ago. Uh, anyway, because uh, now we're being pushed by uh, the deprecation of SMB1. So has anyone got any questions?